a very good evening to one and all the present here i am ashwini along with my colleague ishika on behalf of whole team footprints we warmly welcome all the participants the vice chancellor sir professor parimal vyas sir registrar kem chudasma sir current dean arun pratap sir student dean dr chetan nimbajia sir and cn murthy sir and attendees of all the departments professor and teachers we would also like to welcome an integral part of the student body team fsa team paramars and team prena before we move further i request my team members to thank you thank you ashwini Thank you, Ashwini. I will be playing the uh, launch video in the.
थैंक यू सुजीत नाउ आई रिक्वेस्ट माय कलीग इशिका टू कंटिन्यू फॉर दैंक यू ओके तो दिस ईयर फुटप्रिंट्स हैज लॉन्च्ड मोर न्यू इवेंट्स सच एज माइक्रोन which is software and hardware based event related to embedded system design involving microcontroller selection designomania where students have to show their skills by performing certain tasks using autocad and presentation sheets autocad and sheets openx and innovative product competition is the model making event to enhance creativity and presentation skills now i request i uh, we initiate the event by invoking the blessing of the almighty now i request registrar sir km chudasma sir to inaugurate the event uh good evening one and all am i audible yes sir uh on behalf of uh, senate syndicate honorable vice chancellor sir and on my personal behalf uh first of all i congratulate the faculty and the unit for organizing uh, the event uh, though the innovative way is because of this covid 19 but then uh, the uh, faculty has kept a legacy of uh, what was started long back and uh, this makes us feel proud that our students and teachers uh, find out the ways and means to continue the legacy which is there in the maharaja sayaji rao university of baroda and the very reputed faculty uh uh at this moment uh, let me wish all the best to the uh, students and teachers for uh, undertaking various kinds of activities which are usually there in the event uh, uh, i would not take much time i am here to motivate the entire group of students and teachers who have joined hands for uh, organizing this event uh, in advance i would like to congratulate uh, each and every one Uh, for uh, uh, keeping up on that toes and uh, uh, organizing the uh, event, uh, it is starting today at this point of time, and I wish uh, a very grand success for the entire event. All the best from my side and from the MS University family. Thank you, God. Thank you so much, sir, for your wishes. Uh, so now I am request Professor Arun Pratap, sir. Uh, dean of faculty of technology and engineering the maharaja sayaji rao university of baroda to spot some light on in our event i hope i am audible yes sir yeah so first of all blessings of all of us to all of you uh, because uh, why i am saying so because many or may, of you might not be uh even born when this event started 21 year back and uh, it was started by one of our colleagues in applied physics department dr c s narayan murthy who is right now professor at uh, the national institute of space science and technology tiruvananthapuram uh so it's a matter of great pleasure and coincidence that after 21 years uh, Uh, professor c n murthy has taken over uh, or is going to take over as dean so it is from one murthy to the other that like, this legacy is going on and it it will uh, uh, go a long way this is my hope as regards the title footprints uh, basically the uh, no notion of this particular title is to follow the footprints of uh, uh, the persons who have excelled in their field but right now the things are so dynamic and they are changing so fast that uh what i will advise you as an elderly person that keep the footprints in your mind that okay this is the path which has been traveled already and people have got something people have given something uh keep 
uh, try to follow that path, which is unexplored. You will have uh, uh, maybe some problems, uh, some sort of obstacles, but I am sure that the kind of training which you get at Faculty of Technology and Engineering by the esteemed teachers, heads of the departments who are attending this, and the, uh, and the uh, other students you get, uh, you get motivated, I think uh, you can always uh, be victorious. If not victorious, you will learn something from your failures. So try to explore that path because there is somebody's uh, story that he, he always chose that path which was least explored. So what I will say that don't uh, uh, say that footprints are not important. Footprints are very important because that gives you the kind of, uh, that throws light on uh, which path has been traveled and which path, what kind of uh, uh, gain one had and what kind of obstacles came. Accordingly, you choose your own path. I still remember the uh, message of our uh, uh, former vice chancellor, Professor Yogesh Singh. He used to say, we, we talk about uh, th think out of box, but he used to say that make your own box. So th keep those things in mind. Our blessings are always there. And I'm sure under the uh, uh, very able and dynamic leadership of Professor Parimal Vyas sir as vice chancellor, and our very young, dynamic, and uh, mot motivating registrar, uh, Dr. K.M. Chudasma, sir, you will be able to achieve whatever you wanted, or maybe more than that, because whatever obstacles come or whatever uh, processes are to be followed, they will be speed up, speed up uh, by our registrar, vice chancellor, and everybody in the faculty. And I wish uh, this program a great success, a grand success, and also the incoming dean, uh, Professor C.N. Murthy, a grand success in the years to come. My best wishes to all of you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your wishes. Now, now I request uh, student dean, sir, Chetan Limbajya, sir, uh, Faculty of Technology and Engineering, to give some add some words uh, okay uh, uh, wasn't that the turn of uh, professor murthy sir uh, or uh, your change <clears throat> yes oh right ha, ha. ha. Yes. okay uh, ha. Oh, yeah oh, i re well. request yes yes okay okay yeah, yeah. thank you uh, welcome uh, all and uh, very good evening to all of you Thank you, Professor uh, Arun Pratap, for uh, introducing me to this uh, August uh, gathering. Uh, of course, uh, I'll be uh, in charge or would be there as the dean from Monday. But then, uh, since uh, Professor uh, Arun Pratap has already introduced me, so I thought I should join this uh, uh, young uh, students uh, team who is going to continue the legacy which we had for the last uh, 20 years. I know I had, as yes, uh, Professor Arun Pratap has already mentioned, uh, I had known uh, Professor uh, or Dr. C.S. Narayan Murthy at that time and uh, have seen the uh, footprints grow from strength to strength. And uh, it has been like uh, handing over the baton to the next uh, new team. And I am sure that this new team, which is there here, would uh, take or hand over the baton to the next younger generation uh, in a much better way. As uh, Ishika has already mentioned, that uh, some new new items have been added into this uh, program, especially in a year where we are all meeting uh, for the first time, I would say, in the history of Footprints, we are meeting online. Uh, mm -hmm. All the time, it has been uh, a very, very nice uh, gathering. We used to enjoy a lot of students coming onto our faculty premises, uh, playing all kinds of uh, games, especially technical uh, teams. And uh, also, the I had been part of it for some time, uh, maybe about five, ten years back. Uh, and then I hope that this enthusiasm, which the students are showing, uh, would be infectious, not like the corona. And uh, this enthusiasm should be passed on to other students, your youngsters, and especially for the team who are who are, who are uh, organizing this uh, footprints for this year. Uh, they have done a commendable job in. Uh, uh, bringing in a lot of uh, speakers, as I see from the list of speakers, very internationally renowned speakers have been uh, brought in. 
and i hope that uh, and i wish that all these uh, uh, lectures would be attended and especially what ishika has mentioned about some technical uh, programs i think uh, i'll be able to uh, uh, also join in for some of these uh, programs and uh, and let me know if any difficulty is there because then i would be able to interact with you much better from monday onwards any difficulties are there are welcome we will try to build more and uh, make it much more than better than what it was uh, till now uh, with these few words i welcome you all again and wish you a grand success for this footprints which is a unique you remember all your life that you organize a footprints program when there was pandemic and people were not uh, sitting together right as i see almost 150 students have joined this uh, program and uh, i wish again all the best for the uh, young students to the students who are going to uh, complete their btech in the in the 2021 and also the students of the third year which takes the responsibility of uh, organizing this footprints uh, thank you once again and wish you all the best for a grand success for this program thank you thank you so much sir Uh, now i request uh, uh, student dean sir to add some words uh, uh, the good evening uh, uh, to uh, respected uh, professors professor anup patap sir uh, professor murthy sir uh, registrar sir uh, chudasma sir and uh, all dear students uh, uh, from the bottom of my heart i actually congratulate you all for uh, actually daring to host uh, an event which you have been doing it for last uh, more than 20 years as sir has mentioned that this uh, event is is one of the flagship events of uh, the faculty of technology and engineering uh, which has actually attracted uh, students from all across the state and even out of the state uh, in terms of the audience and participants but in terms of the Uh, faculty or the uh, the speakers and the invited uh, guests and scientists this event actually has been already and always international as uh, we can see from the list of speakers even this time uh, that uh, people from nasa and people from other uh, institutions of uh, international renown have been actually invited to encourage to motivate and to inspire our students so uh, we are actually uh, proud of you all students and uh, i would uh, also note uh, that uh, this year though it was a kind of a, a sad year in many sense and uh, uh, because of the pandemic but our students the students of faculty in technology and engineering have done all this have performed and hosted all the three flagship events prerna paramarsh and now uh, this is the time for uh, footprint online and they have done with uh, all the vigor and uh, have actually matched up the standard of uh, their own events now uh, this footprint uh, uh, which is a technical fest tech fest actually is uh, being inaugurated uh, uh, today and it will last for um, uh, until 21st of this uh, month and it will uh, involve a lot of talks a uh, lot of uh, scientific programs a lot of competition a lot of prize distribution and all the activities that uh, the students do every year offline have been now uh, actually considered and taken up even on the online mode so this is actually extraordinary uh, i would say effort and as the uh, the tagline of the footprint actually says that think beyond do beyond and perform beyond uh, beyond the capacity and beyond the uh, 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 framework of what we think so our students have uh, i am very proud uh, we are all proud that our students have actually dreamed uh, bigger and they have actually ventured into bigger domains and as uh, murthy sir said that uh, you students will remember for the rest of your life that you had actually organized a, 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 an international event even when uh, the world was suffering because of the pandemic so uh, i my role is to just thank and uh, to motivate you all so i thank uh, registrar sir i thank uh, dean sir professor murthy sir and uh, other teachers hri sir and all the students to have joined in uh, for this program and we are actually going to uh, listen to uh, professor matthew greenhouse who is actually a project uh, investigator from nasa uh, for a, a, an enlightening or a, a informative talk and there are several other talks that i request uh, all of you to make sure that you attend because these these talks uh, believe me they are extraordinary and uh, also i must uh, uh, mention uh, at this stage 
that just a couple of uh, days back, we had an interaction with uh, Professor Roger Hunter, who is also from NASA. And he actually expressed his desire that uh, he would be very willing and very uh, eager to welcome some of our students from the technology faculty to also join in some program at the NASA. And uh, he actually uh, uh, told me, requested me to spread the message uh, to all the students. So uh, this way also uh, the interactions and uh, deliberations help you students to think about uh, something beyond the horizon, something beyond uh, the uh, routine curriculum, etc. So uh, my best wishes and uh, uh, I mean, good feeling for the event. So uh, go ahead and uh, uh, do well all the students. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So now I request to Sujit to continue uh, the kaleidoscope segment, brief introduction of kaleidoscope. Thank you, Shiva. But uh, before before going to the kaleidoscope segment, uh, I would like to take this uh, platform and I would like to use this opportunity to thank our uh, well wishers and our and I would like to share our grip, uh, earnest gratitude for our sponsors um, whose uh, whose help has uh, been tremendous throughout this uh, th this twenty first edition of Footprints. So I would just like to. Uh, uh, show our gratitude, show footprints gratitude to all our sponsors. So first of all, we have IMS, who is the title sponsor of Footprints 21st edition. Then we have Extel. Uh, Extel has been the sponsor for the Kaleidoscope segment. That is, Kaleidoscope is the series of guest lectures, workshops, and exhibition that we'll be having after this, followed by after this uh, opening ceremony session. Then we have IC Gate Academy, uh, that is the pa gate partner of Footprints 21. Then we have 9 SEM, skill partner. Then uh, Footprints 21 supported by INI. Sanganiki, the event for electrical and electronics engineering department students, that is being sponsored by Mac Power Solutions Private Limited. Then we have Rasanam sponsor Unique. Rasanam is the technical event of chemical engineering department hash market, which is a stock market related event. And uh, hash market partner is the last trade investment journal. Then we have online platform partner CodeChef and Designomina sponsor A1 Industries. Designomina is technical event for the students of mechanical and metallurgical engineering department. And I would also like to share a small video of our main title sponsor, that is IMS. about IMS, who is our main title sponsor for this year. So now, as, as we all are here for the opening ceremony, which is uh, which, uh, with the blessings of uh, all the dignitaries that we have today, uh, Narayan Bhati sir, uh, Dr. K. N. Tudasama sir, Arundhata sir, and Chaitanya Nimachya sir. So thank you all for being this, uh, for opening and uh, guiding us and being uh, there as a mentor for having a successful event. So. Now the main, uh, the other segment today we are going to have is Kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope is a series of guest lectures, workshops, and exhibition 
and this year we have excel industries as the sponsor of kaleidoscope so kaleidoscope uh, today as the first speaker we have dr matthew green of sir with us so before that i would like to share a small video of the kaleidoscope segment which uh, uh, which basically portrays all the uh, guest lectures and workshop that footprints is uh, footprints has brought to brought to the students brought for the students so i will be sharing the video uh, of the kaleidoscope segment So that was a glimpse of the kaleidoscope segment that we are going to have this year. And so today, being the first as the first guest speaker, we have Dr. Matthew Greenhouse, uh, Matthew Greenhouse sir with us. So Matthew Greenhouse is a project scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope at NASA, which is being launched, which will, which will be launched in October 2021. And he is the principal investigator of micro shutter technology development. He has served in Smithsonian Institute as astrophysicist and in European Space Agency flight mission team. So we have uh, Matthew Greenhouse sir with us. So, hello sir. Hello, it's wonderful to be here. And thank you all for dialing in to learn about the James Webb Space Telescope. Welcome to Footprint, sir. So now we will be having uh, the guest uh, guest session, and the webinar will be of uh, like the first uh, Matthew sir will be uh, having his talk, and then for last last twenty minutes we will be having question and answer session. So, sir. What okay. So when you you're when you're ready, I'll go ahead and share my screen. You just let me know. Yes, sir. We can start. Okay. Stand by.
Oops. Stand by. Okay, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. All good. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you for thank you for joining, and um, I'll tell you the whole story of the James Webb Space Telescope that'll be launching uh, in just a few months uh, at the end of October of uh, this year. All right. Now, um, space telescopes are uh, astronomers' most powerful tools for uh, looking back in time. Traveling back in time is the stuff of science fiction, but looking back in time is science fact. And it works as a result of the finite speed of light and the associated transmission delay. If you look at a person seated next to you or nearby right now, you're not seeing them as they really are. You're seeing them as they were a few nanoseconds ago. Now, a nanosecond is a really small uh, period of time. And so that transmission delay is imperceptible. But as we look at objects more distant from us, the delay becomes more important. For example, if we had a magic switch that could turn off the sun and we turned off the sun with that switch, it would be 500 seconds before we noticed anything happened. That's because it takes 500 seconds for light to travel from the sun uh, to the earth. And as we look at more distant objects, the closest stars, the closest galaxies, uh, this transmission delay becomes it truly enormous. And we are literally looking back in the past and seeing objects as they were uh, in the past. Um, so this is primarily what JWST and, and most telescopes today are designed to do. Now the JWST mission was conceived in the late 1990s to uh, find the relationship between this famous image of the oldest light in the universe. Uh, this was recorded with NASA's COBE satellite and a Nobel Prize was awarded for this. This is a picture of uh, the moment in time when the universe became transparent and light could escape. So we were trying to relate this famous image to this famous image, which was at the time the deepest image uh, ever recorded by the Hubble Space Telescope. So the COBE image is looking at the universe when it is a few hundred thousand years old. And uh, this HST image is looking at the universe uh, when it was about a billion years old. In between this epoch in time and this epoch in time, there is a mysterious uh, unobserved uh, epoch known as the cosmic dark zone. And it's a very important period in the evolution of the universe because this is the time when the first stars and galaxies formed. And the reason it's mysterious is that we haven't had the right type of telescope uh, before JWST to look at that period uh, in the evolution of the universe, to look back in time uh, to that period. And that uh, was the primary objective uh, of the uh, JWST uh, mission. Now, JWST, like Hubble, will do lots and lots of other transformational science, but that was the original primary objective of the mission, and it's the requirements of that objective that govern uh, much of the design of the JWST. Now, when Hubble took its famous image, it did so by staring at a single spot in the sky for a long, long, long time, leaving the camera shutter open, if you will, to take the deepest image that it could possibly take. And as you can see, that image still has lots of stars and galaxies uh, in it. 
lots of uh, um, high redshift red galaxies uh, yet to be seen in that image. And so uh, JW, HST cannot see uh, back to the beginning, the, to the formation of galaxies for reasons uh, that we'll discuss. Now, when JWST flies, it will do much the same thing. Uh, but JWST is much bigger than Hubble, and it observes in a different portion of the spectrum than Hubble. So when it stares at a single spot in the sky for a long, long, long time, it should see back to the uh, epoch of the formation of galaxies, such that there are no more galaxies uh, to see beyond that epoch. Now, when we say that JWST will see the first galaxies, we don't mean that you will pick up a copy of the newspaper and see a picture of the first galaxy. What we mean is that we will measure the star formation rate per unit volume in the universe as a function of look back time. And we, if we're successful, we should reach a look back time where there is a precipitous drop off. And that will be the signature of the formation uh, epoch. And so JWST should be able to work uh, to a, a redshift of about 17. And uh, this is where uh, the limit of Hubble uh, is. You can see these error bars starting to grow because you're you know, reaching the limit of the Hubble system. And uh, as we look back in time farther than Hubble can look, uh, you can see that we will be able to discriminate various models of how the universe evolves. So this should be a, a, a key observation for our understanding uh, of cosmology. Now, in addition to seeing the first stars and galaxies, uh, JWST will show us um, everything in between. It will show us uh, how the universe evolved from that point to the present day. We know that the matter in the universe is distributed in a spider web uh, type arrangement that is shown here in this supercomputer simulation of the uh, evolution of the universe. And JWST will allow us to anchor simulations like this to observation to reality so that we can better understand uh, how the universe evolved and how uh, galaxies are assembled uh, into uh, this structure. Now, when we look at galaxies nearby today, uh, they have the shapes or morphologies that you've seen in your astronomy textbooks. Some have spiral arms, some have bulges, uh, some are disk-like, some are spherical, but they are all very symmetric, regular shapes or, or morphologies. But when we look back in time as far as Hubble can uh, observe, we see that the shapes of galaxies, their morphologies, are actually different as we look back in time. The very regular morphologies that we see uh, in the nearby universe become very peculiar or irregular as we look back uh, in time to them. And so that is something that we want to study the origin of. We want to know why uh, that is uh, happening. Today we model, the best theory of that is that these irregular morphologies shown here and seen with Hubble are the result of galaxy collisions. And morphologies like this can be uh, accurately reproduced with models of galaxy collisions. And with JWST, we'll be able to actually see this evolution and uh, understand it much better than we can uh, today. Okay, now you've all heard the, the statement that space is expanding or the universe is expanding. And this cartoon shows uh, what is meant by that. Uh, shown here is a, a piece of raisin bread dough. And like all bread dough, it's left to rise. And so this part of the cartoon is showing uh, the dough rising. And imagine that you were sitting on one of the raisins. What would you see as the dough rises? 
you would see that all the other raisins are moving away from you, even though um, we, you are not at the center uh, of the expansion. And so that's what we mean by space is expanding. The medium of space itself is expanding. Now, the light emitted by uh, primeval galaxies is emitted in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. But as it travels to us through the expanding space, through that expanding raisin bread dough, it, the wavelength is stretched into the infrared. So in order to observe those first galaxies, uh, we need to observe in the infrared part of the spectrum. We have to build an infrared uh, telescope. And that infrared uh, capability is crucial uh, to seeing the first galaxies. And it's also important for lots of other science. So the light, what is meant by the infrared? The light that our eyes can see is a very, very narrow slice of the whole uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum, as, it call, as it's called, the whole spectrum of light. Our eyes evolved to see just this narrow slice because that's the part that uh, reaches the surface of the Earth that our uh, atmosphere is transparent to. Longer wavelengths, as we, as we increase the wavelength of light beyond the visible, we have the infrared part of the spectrum. We, our eyes can't see it but our skin can feel it. If you hold your hand near a stove burner, you can feel the heat with your hand and what your hand, the skin is feeling the infrared radiation uh, from that um, stove burner. So this is the part of the spectrum that the JWST is designed to operate in. Hubble, on the other hand, is designed to operate in the visible and ultraviolet part of the spectrum. As we make the wavelength shorter than our eyes can see, we are in this part of the spectrum that's called the ultraviolet. And again, our eyes can't see it, but this radiation can burn our skin, for example, if you stay out in the sun too long. Okay, so the JWST is designed to observe in a different part of spectrum than Hubble. And that's crucial to its ability to see the first galaxies and to do other uh, important science. Now, JWST will also study how stars are formed in our own galaxy and others. The spaces between the stars, the so-called interstellar space, is not an empty vacuum. It's filled with giant clouds of molecular gas and dust. And these molecular clouds are the birthplaces of stars. This is a famous Hubble Space Telescope image of such a molecular cloud called the Eagle Nebula. And um, these uh, pillars, if you will, are pillars of molecular gas that are mixed with dust. And so they are opaque uh, in visible light. And inside them, uh, stars are forming. But if we look at this same field in the infrared, the longer wavelength infrared light can see through the dust and thus uh, uh, enable us to observe uh, the actual uh, star formation itself. We know the basics of star formation. We know that these clouds collapse on themselves uh, by self-gravity. And as they collapse, the pressure inside the cloud increases. And as that pressure increases, the temperature of the gas increases. It's, it's exactly like if you fill your uh, bicycle tire uh, at the gas station, as you compress the air in the tire, the tire gets warm. The same physics uh, is in play uh, here. But in, the, in this case, the temperature gets very high to the point where nuclear fusion can occur. And then uh, at that point, uh, star, self-luminous stars uh, are born. So that's the basics. But there are lots of details that we don't know. When stars form, there are typically large outflow jets that are produced, and there are typically disks of uh, debris that are um, left over from the star formation. And so the newly formed stars are surrounded by debris disks. And those debris disks 
are of crucial scientific interest because those are the birthplaces of, sol of planets, of solar systems uh, like our own. And uh, so we want to understand a lot more about how solar systems and planets form. And this will be a major area of study for the JWST. This is a picture, uh, an artist's rendition of the debris disk around our own star, the sun, alongside a map of the actual uh, debris. These are the so-called Kuiper belt objects or trans-Newtonian objects. And they're of tremendous scientific interest because they are primordial material left over from the formation of our own solar system. So we've put special tracking, a non-sidereal tracking into the JWST so that we can observe uh, the outer planets of our solar system, and in particular, uh, these Kuiper belt uh, objects. We recently uh, did a flyby of a Kuiper belt object using uh, NASA's New Horizon mission. After the New Horizon mission observed Pluto, we sent it on to uh, one of these Kuiper belt objects, and this is the very first image ever recorded uh, and the only image of a Kuiper belt object. And it's very exciting uh, for planet formation theory because you could see this object turned out to be two smaller objects uh, fused together. And uh, this structure has since been modeled uh, as uh, the result of a very low velocity, you know, few kilometer per second uh, collision between two particles. And one finds that they do stick uh, and fuse like that. And so that's very important for uh, planet formation uh, theory. And JWST will be observing many, many of these Kuiper belt objects um, uh, to help us understand how planets form. Now, uh, when I was a graduate student, there were no known planets. Uh, but now we know that for, for all practical purposes, all stars have planets. And as a consequence of that, uh, we know that there are billions of potentially habitable worlds uh, in the galaxy. It doesn't mean they are inhabited, but they are uh, habitable. And uh, we feel that all sun-like stars uh, have planets. And so when I was a student, the search for extraterrestrial life was you know, the stuff of science fiction. Now it is very much mainstream science and a major science objective uh, of NASA. And we have learned how to search for life on exoplanets, as they're called, planets orbiting stars other than the sun, by studying their atmospheres, by looking for the impact that life has on the atmosphere of planets. And so the search for life is very much on and very real today. And uh, it works uh, like this. It works uh, by using spectroscopy. Atoms and molecules emit uh, a unique light signature uh, that reveals their presence and also reveals uh, what they are. So we can tell the difference between light emitted by an, an oxygen molecule or a nitrogen uh, molecule uh, by comparing observed spectra to what we see uh, in the laboratory. And JWST will be able to take spectra of the atmospheres of exoplanets by a process called transit spectroscopy. And it works uh, as is shown in this cartoon. Many uh, extrasolar systems uh, will be oriented so that the plane of the planet's orbit uh, will lie along our line of sight. Uh, so if we have this configuration where we have a star and a planet orbiting the star along our line of sight to our, our uh, observatory, and we take a spectra, what we're actually recording is the spectra of the star plus the spectra of the planet's atmosphere. Now, we simply wait a little while for the planet to move out of the way, take another spectra of the star, 
subtract the two, and voila, we have a spectrum of the planet's atmosphere. And Hubble has, in other observatories, has been doing this now for a number of years, and it's a very well understood, effective technique uh, for obtaining the spectra of the atmospheres of other planets. And we will be working uh, to um, understand, to search for uh, what are called biomarkers, spectros spectroscopic signatures uh, of life uh, of chemical species uh, that uh, should not exist in the absence of without biological processes. So for example, here is a spectrum of the atmosphere of Mars, Earth, and Venus. And all of these bumps and wiggles in the spectrum are due to individual atoms and molecules in the atmosphere. And we can, ident we can identify which atoms and molecules those are. If the Earth did not have an atmosphere, the spectrum would just be a flat line. So we'll be using this technique to obtain spectra of exoplanet atmospheres to look for chemistry in the atmosphere that uh, is indicative of biological processes. And JWST can detect uh, water, for example, on an exoplanet that is just a few times uh, the size uh, of the Earth. We'll be very much focusing the search for life on planets uh, with water. Why do we focus on planets with water? It's not because alien life might get thirsty and need something to drink, but rather in order for the organic chemistry of life to occur on a planetary scale, one needs a liquid solvent that is available on a planetary scale, and water is what we're most familiar with. So this should be a very exciting aspect of um, JWST's uh, mission. Now, when we first put pencil to paper uh, in the late 1990s on what we had to build to do that science, we concluded that we needed seven times the light gathering capacity of the Hubble Space Telescope. This is because those primeval galaxies, those first galaxies are very, very faint. And so we needed to uh, a much bigger mirror uh, to see those uh, faint objects in a reasonable amount of time. We needed Hubble's ability to see fine detail, angular resolution uh, as they call it. And we needed that in a, at a longer wavelength in the infrared part of the spectrum. So uh, that also requires a, a bigger mirror. And uh, in order to see those uh, first galaxies, we this observatory uh, had to have capabilities spanning uh, the optical to mid-infrared spectrum. Uh, so JWST uh, works from about 0.6 microns, which is in the red end of the visible spectrum, out to the mid-infrared about 28 microns of, uh, of wavelength. Now, when we realized that we needed this capability, we also realized that we had two huge problems that almost stopped the project in its tracks. Uh, but fortunately, we were able to solve those problems so that uh, the mission uh, could proceed. In order to get the bigger mirror that was needed for the seven times light gathering capacity and uh, angular resolution, the mirror turned out to be bigger in diameter than the biggest rocket. And in order to have the infrared capability, we realized that we had to cool this telescope to a very, very low temperature, uh, about minus 230 degrees uh, Celsius or 40 to 50 uh, degrees above absolute zero. And there is no mechanical refrigerator powerful enough to cool something uh, as big as JWST to such a low temperature. So those were the problems that we faced uh, right in the beginning. And um, let's talk about how we solved them. Let's talk about the cooling problem uh, first. Now, JWST will not be placed in orbit about the Earth the way that uh, Hubble is. 
Rather, it will be placed at a point called the second Lagrange point of the Sun-Earth system, or the L2 point uh, for short. And this point is a point in space that is about uh, 1.5 uh, million kilometers from the Earth in the anti-Sun direction. So it's here. And what's special uh, about that point? Well, one can see that in this configuration, all the sources of heat that would warm the JWST, the sun, the earth, the moon, all lie in one direction. And so we realized that if we deployed a giant sun shield, we could make the telescope live in the shadow of the sun shield. And as long as the telescope is in the shadow, we calculated that it would cool naturally just by radiation to the cold darkness of space to the desired temperature. But at the same time, the JWST has to be able to observe uh, all over the sky. And so we, uh, we sized this sun shield so that we could tilt five degrees toward the sun and we would still be in the shadow and we could tilt 45 degrees away from the sun and still be in the shadow. So now we've observed an arc on the sky that's 50 degrees long. And one can just see intuitively, if we rotate the JWST about the Earth-Sun line, that won't affect our shadow situation at all. And so now this 50 degree arc turns into an annulus that covers about 35% of the sky. So at any moment in time, JWST can observe 35% of the sky and still be in the shadow of its sun shield. And now as the, L the Earth and the L2 point orbit the sun, we're rotating about this axis. And so every six months, this annulus sweeps over the whole sky. So every six months, JWST can observe any spot in the sky and still be in the shadow of its sun shield. Now, and it's very important that it stay in the shadow of the sun shield because once it's cold, if sun were to shine on the observatory, uh, it might break as a result of that. Now, uh, as shown here, uh, we're not gonna put the JWST exactly at the L2 point, but we're gonna put it in a small orbit about the L2 point. And that's because we have to stay outside of the Earth's shadow. We're generating electricity with solar rays, so it's important that we stay outside the Earth's shadow. So that is a call the libration point uh, orbit uh, about the L2 point, and it's an unstable orbit. And that means that we have to maintain the orbit with station keeping thrusters. And the propellant for those thrusters is the expendable supply that will ultimately limit uh, the life of the JWST. So unlike Hubble, the JWST mission does have a finite end to it. When that propellant is used up, the mission will be over and the JWST will fall out of that libration point orbit into some general sun-centered uh, orbit and just uh, uh, stay there uh, forever. Another thing about the L2 point that's important for the mission, if we place an object that is farther from the sun uh, than the earth, as you know, we would expect that object to orbit the sun with a period that is greater than the earth. However, the, J the L2 point is special. The L2 point, uh, of course, orbits with exactly the same period as the earth. And that means that by putting JWST there, the telecommunications range between the JWST and the Earth will remain constant over the whole mission. And that's very important for our uh, ability to get the data back uh, to the Earth. So that's how we solved the uh, thermal problem. The problem of the big mirror uh, was solved by adopting something called a segmented mirror uh, architecture. The big JWST mirror is not a single sheet of material, but rather it consists of 18 hexagonal segments that are adjustable 
so that they can play together as if they all were uh, a single mirror. And uh, this allows us to fold the mirror inside the rocket. And the JWST is designed uh, to integrate with the five meter diameter fairing of an Ariane 5 uh, rocket. This is a French rocket uh, that we'll be using to launch JWST. Uh, and the Ariane 5 will be launched from Karoo Launch Center in French Guiana. French Guiana is located on the east coast of uh, South America. The payload is about 6.5 metric tons. It's launched at room, ambient room temperature and then will cool uh, to the very low cryogenic temperatures that we need after the sunshade uh, is deployed. Now, in the next slide, I'm gonna show you the origami of how this unfolding occurs. But what you'll see in, uh, in that uh, animation requires 40 deployable structures and 178 release mechanisms, all of which have to work perfectly uh, for the mission to succeed. Okay, so the first thing that happens is the solar ray comes out so that we, be, we can become power positive. We're operating on batteries up to this point. And there are a few uh, flight dynamic maneuvers uh, that have to occur uh, in order to navigate to uh, the L2 point. Then you see the high gain antenna unfolding so that we can begin communicating with the JWST. And what you see happening here are, there are these are giant pallet structures that have that uh, giant sunshade folded up uh, inside them. And so they are beginning to deploy here. This mass that is extending here is designed to provide thermal separation between what will be a cryogenic telescope and what must remain uh, an ambient temperature spacecraft located here. Now these telescoping booms are now pulling the sun shield out of that pallet structure and spreader bars on the periphery separate the sunshade into its five layers would give it its thermal performance. We'll talk more about that. There are various other um, radiators uh, that deploy uh, that are important for the cooling uh, of JWST. That one cools the science instruments. And now you're seeing the secondary mirror of the telescope unfold. And now you see the wings of the giant primary mirror unfold, uh, much like a, uh, a round drop leaf kitchen table. All right, so that's, that's how it works. Let's talk a little bit more about the telescope. This is a picture of the flight telescope in a, a clean room um, at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, this shows the size of that primary mirror compared to Hubble and compared to our most recent infrared telescope, uh, Spitzer, whose mission uh, recently ended. So this is, this is a really enormous telescope in terms of space telescopes. And the telescope design is called a three mirror and a stigmat, and it works like this. Light from uh, the objects comes in and reflects from the large primary mirror onto that secondary mirror that you saw unfold in the animation. And then it, it, it passes through a focus to a tertiary mirror, hence the name three mirror and a stigmat. And in our design, uh, it then goes to a fourth mirror that is articulated under computer control. Um, and that, that articulated mirror is designed to uh, eliminate the blurring effects that would occur from vibration that is produced by machinery running in the spacecraft. And then the light goes uh, to the science instruments. And you can, you can see here the 18 segments if you look closely uh, at the figure. The uh, mirror is coated with gold because gold has the highest reflectivity uh, in the part of the spectrum uh, that we're working with. Now, the JWST mirror is not made of glass. 
It's made of a, a material called beryllium. And the reason we chose beryllium was that as the JWST uh, slews across the sky, points in different directions uh, on the sky, there will be thermal gradients that form in the mirror. And we didn't want those thermal gradients to spoil the shape of the mirror. So we had to find a material that had a low coefficient of thermal expansion at the operating temperature of about 50 Kelvin. And at the same time, this material had to have high thermal conductivity, so the gradients would be minimized, and it had to be very light and strong. And so beryllium has uh, all of those uh, properties. Um, weight is a premium for anything uh, that flies, airplanes, spacecraft, and so forth. And the figure of merit here is aerial density, mass per unit area. And the JWST mirror segments are about six times lighter than the Hubble mirror in terms of uh, aerial density, and they represent the current state of art. This beryllium starts out in a powder form and it's compressed under a tremendous heat and pressure into a, what's called a billet, a big block of uh, beryllium metal. And then after we form that metal, we machine away almost all of it to achieve that uh, very uh, low aerial uh, density. Uh, so this is what the mirrors look like uh, front uh, and back. Now, if you're paying attention, you'll realize that we have another big problem. These mirrors need to be polished. And um, so how do, how do we polish mirrors? You, we rub on them with gritty stuff until they become smooth and shiny enough. Well, that's a room temperature operation. So we're gonna operate the telescope uh, at about 50 Kelvin. If we polish it at room temperature, that means that we have to put in the wrong shape at room temperature in order to get the right shape at the operating temperature. Well, this is done through the magic of computer modeling, but computer modeling is not perfect. And so we had to follow uh, an iterative process whereby we would polish the mirrors part way and then put them into a specially instrumented space simulation chamber at Marshall Space Flight Center, a chamber that could simulate both the vacuum and the uh, coldness of space so that we could cool the mirrors down to their operating temperature, observe them with special optics test equipment to verify how the performance is actually tracking uh, to our model. And then we would make adjustments in the model and iterate in that fashion so that we could produce what's shown here, which is real data. Um, this is the, uh, the figure of a, a JWST mirror segment at ambient temperature and then at the operating temperature. And uh, so this took many, many years to do this, but all that's been done now and it, it's behind us. But it was one of the challenges that we had to overcome in order to build uh, the JWST. Now, after building the mirrors, we had to develop a, a structure that would hold the mirrors in place. And this structure has very uh, difficult requirements on it. It has to withstand you know, 300 degrees of temperature change. And it has to withstand the inertial loads of the rocket flight. And it has to do all that while keeping the mirrors precisely in the right precision, in position where precisely means a small fraction of the wavelength of light uh, being observed. And so to do that, we had to invent a composite material and, uh, develop, and develop that into a structure. The structure involves more than 3000 piece parts that are bonded together in a very precise way to produce uh, the telescope structure uh, that you see uh, here. Okay, this is a mechanical, uh, this is a, a walkout test of our uh, deployment mechanism design for the secondary mirror that you saw in uh, the animation. 
And this is just an example of some of the kinds of testing that we need to do to design systems like this. Engineering is very much an empirical science. And so we have to follow a, a process of designing and then testing and then iterating uh, based on the results of the test. Now, what you see here is a mechanical, a robotic pick and place machine, if you will, that we had to develop to uh, integrate the primary mirror segments onto that structure. What you see happening here are the actual flight mirror segments being installed onto the structure. The segments are black because they, they have a cover on them that is black, which is designed to keep them clean. And this robotic arm uh, has a very high precision end defector on it, which is helping the technicians uh, get the uh, mirror segments in exactly the right position. You get the idea. This is an example of how we handle the JWST uh, in a clean room uh, at NASA. Um, a typical craning operation. This is the actual flight uh, telescope. And here they're putting it on a turnover fixture to get ready uh, for some testing. Just to give you an idea of, of what that looks like. Okay, let's talk a little bit about that sunshade. The JWST sunshade has an SPF of a million. So if you had this on the beach, you would be very well protected. It literally is the size of a tennis court. It's 73 by 40 feet. And it has five layers to give it uh, that SPF uh, of a million. It's made of a heat resistant plastic called Kapton that's thinner than human hair. The sun facing side is coated with silicon. So it actually looks pink in reality. And uh, all the other uh, layers are coated with vacuum deposited aluminum uh, to give them a uh, good thermal performance. And you'll notice in this illustration that the sun shield is not flat. It has a special curved shape to it. And that shape is, uh, is very important to ensuring that stray light doesn't reflect uh, from the sunshade into the telescope and affect the measurements uh, that we're making. So in order to create a curved surface out of flat cloth, one has to make a quilt. And so each layer of this sunshade is a quilt of about 50 individual pieces. And that involves about 7,000 inches, excuse me, of thermal spot welds uh, that um, have to be extremely precise. Uh, uh, precision of almost uh, a millimeter uh, precise over such a tremendous structure. So the, the sun shield was a tremendous technology challenge in and of itself, uh, but fortunately we were able to, uh, able to design and uh, build that. This is uh, uh, again an example of a, of a test of how the sun shield is folded into those pallet structures. These tables that you see are there to provide gravity offloading. They're not there uh, in space. Uh, but here you can see those telescopic booms pulling the sunshade out of the pallet structure. And if you notice, there's a person that appears in the center here, and that gives you a sense of scale of uh, how big this sunshade uh, really is. Here you can also see the quilting and uh, you'll see um, how the layers themselves uh, are separated. And there is a tensioned uh, cord uh, in the periphery of each layer uh, that uh, keeps the layer tight and gives, helps it uh, achieve its, uh, its uh, desired shape. Okay, that's the telescope. The job of the telescope is to collect the light from the objects that we're observing and send it to the science instruments. Uh, the job that's being done by the science instruments is to do a little bit of processing on that light and then to uh, detect it uh, with electronic detectors so that the light can be uh, converted to a digital signal that is then transmitted uh, to the ground. 
Uh, so the JWST has four science instruments and a fine guidance sensor. Uh, and this is what they look like. Uh, this is the main near infrared camera on the JWST. This is the instrument that will see those first galaxies to form uh, in the universe. And uh, it does uh, broadband uh, imagery, a little bit of spectroscopy, and uh, also coronography uh, to see uh, those exoplanets uh, and uh, their atmospheres. Uh, this uh, was made uh, in the United States uh, by uh, the University of Arizona and their contractor, uh, Lockheed uh, Martin Advanced Technology Center in Palo Alto, California. This is the main uh, near-infrared spectrograph on the JWST. Uh, this is an instrument that's very unusual. It's the first multi-object spectrograph to fly in space. This is the instrument that will obtain spectra of those first uh, galaxies uh, to show us uh, uh, what the galaxies are made of, what their metal content is and so forth. And what makes it unusual is that it is a multi-object spectrograph. It can obtain spectra of 100 targets simultaneously and keep all those spectra separate. And that was crucial to the mission because these first galaxies are very, very faint. And so if we had to take spectra of them one object at a time, we would not be able to get a large enough sample size uh, within the life of the mission. So we had to give it this multiplexing capability of 100 uh, galaxies per exposure. The instrument is also unusual in that it's made of an advanced ceramic material called silicon uh, carbide. This instrument uh, is a partnership between the European Space Agency and uh, uh, NASA, and it was produced by uh, STEC and uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, finally, this is the uh, mid-infrared instrument on the JWST. This instrument will give humanity its very first high-definition view of the infrared universe. It does imagery, spectroscopy, and also uh, coronography uh, to observe uh, those exoplanets uh, and their atmospheres. Um, this was produced by a consortium of 10 European countries, along with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, and finally, uh, this is uh, the Canadian instrument on the JWST. This was produced by the Canadian Space Agency. It is two instruments in one. Uh, one instrument is science instrument that we call NIRIS, is designed exclusively to do spectroscopy of those uh, exoplanet atmospheres and to search for uh, evidence of life. And then the other part of it is the fine guidance sensor that allows us to point the JWST telescope. And that fine guidance sensor can sense pointing errors to a millionth of a degree or about three uh, milliarc seconds. Those four instruments are integrated into a module shown here. And then this module is itself integrated to the back of the uh, telescope. Uh, so uh, that instrument module, of course, has to be rigorously tested before we integrate it to the telescope and launch it into space. Um, so to test it, we used uh, a very large space simulation chamber uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, it has to simulate the cold vacuum of space, the operating conditions. And so it is a, it is a giant vacuum vessel uh, that has liquid nitrogen and liquid helium cooled shrouds to simulate temperature. And then even though this is the largest uh, uh, simulation chamber at Goddard Space Flight Center, it's not big enough to put the instrument module and the JWST telescope inside. And so we had to use a simulator of the JWST telescope to feed a high fidelity simulated telescope beam into uh, the science instrument module uh, in order to test all the instruments uh, and the module. 
And this is a picture of what the lower part of this actually looked like. And you can see that these are very, very difficult, complicated tests. And some of them, the most difficult cryogenic tests that NASA's ever done. And to get this instrument module ready, uh, we had to do three 100 day long tests uh, during which we were operating the test 24 seven. So it required an enormous effort of a very large number of people, but that work of course is all behind us now and was uh, successfully finished. Now, after testing the instrument module and integrating it to the back of the telescope, we then had to put that assembly uh, into a special shipping container that is designed to keep that assembly in, in the special environment that it needs to remain qualified to fly in space. It's a very cool, a very clean and very carefully controlled uh, environment. And the shipping container was designed to integrate with a C-5 transport aircraft. So this truck mounted container could actually drive onto the aircraft, fits, but you can see just barely. And we flew it uh, from uh, Andrews Air Force Base near Washington, DC uh, to Houston, Texas, to Johnson Space Flight Center to do some more testing in the largest cryogenic space simulation chamber in the world. It's called Chamber A. And this chamber is uh, left over from NASA's Apollo program. And it was designed to test the Apollo command module. So this is looking through the door of that chamber in Apollo times, and you can see the command module uh, inside here. We had to resurrect that chamber from uh, storage and uh, get it ready to test the JWST. And the test configuration is uh, as shown here. The JWST was rolled into the chamber on rails, then suspended from the top of the chamber on rods. And it was uh, set up so that it could observe special optics test equipment in the top of the chamber to do what's called an end-to-end -end optical test. And it's, it's just like the name suggests, we are shining light through the whole telescope instrument system to make sure that the whole thing works as planned. This is a test that we did not do on the Hubble Space Telescope program with consequences that many of you are aware of. And so, although this is, a, is an extremely difficult, expensive test, uh, we, we didn't skip that test on JWST. And uh, it's fortunate that we didn't because we did find some problems in that test that we had to fix. That work is all finished uh, now. And so with the completion of that, we went back onto the aircraft and then flew from Houston, Texas to Los Angeles, California, where our contractor Northrop Grumman Aerospace Systems could then add the spacecraft and the sun shield uh, to the telescope and instrument uh, assembly. Let's take a look at how that, what that looks like. This is the uh, sun shield assembly and the spacecraft is under the Once we completed that, we weren't done yet. Uh, after putting those pieces together, we then had to do what is called vibration and acoustics testing. When that payload is put into the rocket, as the rocket is launched and flies, it's subject to a great deal of vibration and sound energy. 
So we had to put that assembly into a vibration in acoustics simulation chamber where it is shaken and blasted with acoustic energy. That's been done now successfully. And right now uh, it's back in that clean room that you just saw in the video. And we're finishing up the post environmental test uh, tests of, of the uh, facility to make sure everything still works after all that vibration and acoustics. And we're folding it up and packaging it to uh, ship to the launch site, which will be done uh, uh, in a July uh, timeframe. But now with the addition of the spacecraft and the sun shield, it's too heavy and big to fly on the aircraft. And so uh, again, it'll be in a special shipping container, uh, but this time it'll roll on to a roll-on, roll-off transport ship shown here. And that ship will leave from the port of Los Angeles and travel about 6,900 uh, nautical miles through the Panama Canal over to uh, French uh, Guiana, uh, where it can then be uh, uh, transferred uh, to the launch site to begin its launch site uh, processing. This is your telescope, an engineering marvel, an exploration powerhouse. Use it to look back in time and explore the first galaxies that formed after the Big Bang, to peer into atmospheres of planets orbiting the stars. It's your eyepiece to the uncharted, unknown, and unimagined. This is the largest, most complex, and challenging space telescope ever constructed. It will change our understanding of the universe and our place in it. The James Webb Space Telescope. Equipped with the largest primary mirror ever to be flown in space, at six and a half meters, it's more than six times the size of the Hubble Space Telescope primary mirror. Webb's four cutting edge infrared instruments and cameras operate at super cold temperatures. Temperatures colder than the surface of Pluto. Getting this cold is done with the help of the largest sun shield ever flown, a five layer, tennis court sized sun shield that blocks heat from the sun, earth, and moon. Webb will be the first telescope to detect light from the most distant galaxies in the universe. These first galaxies formed about 13 and a half billion years ago, only 300 or so million years after the Big Bang. Webb carries advanced technologies to tackle some of the most fundamental questions about the universe. How did the first galaxies form and evolve? Are there chemical signatures of the building blocks of life on other worlds? Is our solar system unique? Launching such a large telescope into space is an incredible engineering challenge. Fully deployed, Webb is too large to fit inside any rocket fairing. Engineers designed it to be folded, like origami, to squeeze inside the European Space Agency's five meter diameter Ariane 5 rocket fairing. After launch, controllers on the ground deploy Webb remotely. Deployment is an intricate ballet. For nearly three weeks, controllers carefully unfold Webb after this delicate dance, Webb's golden mirrors are precisely aligned using motors behind each hexagonal mirror segment, adjusting them to form one perfect mirror. Once the instruments are fully cooled, the exploration will begin. Webb is a technological challenge like no other, born of the efforts of thousands of people across the United States, Canada, and Europe. The James Webb Space Telescope is your telescope. Use it to explore, to challenge theories, to see sights yet unseen. It's yours to unfold the beauty and mystery in the universe and 
our place in it. All right, when the JWST mission is over, you don't have to worry that uh, it will have answered all the questions. It will rewrite the astronomy textbooks as Hubble did, uh, but there's a lot of questions that JWST uh, cannot answer. And of course, it will raise questions that we can't even imagine today. You know, what happened before the, uh, the Big Bang? What's at the center of a black hole? You know, what is the uh, universe evolving uh, into? You know, are we alone? Uh, there are big questions uh, that we'll be passing to uh, the next generation, uh, many of whom are on this phone call uh, today. And I want to emphasize that the people who do this kind of work, the people who build spacecraft like this, who design them, build them, use them, come from all walks of life in all backgrounds. Uh, and no matter what uh, your background is, or you can also uh, uh, join this quest for answers and you can uh, um, um, follow this career path uh, uh, as, um, as, as your goal. There's a quote here that I'd like to read. The book of nature lies continuously open before our eyes, but it can't be understood without first learning to understand the language and characters uh, in which it is written. It is written in mathematical language in its characters are geometric figures. That's as true today as it was 400 years ago when Galileo said it. So uh, to follow this career path, to uh, join this quest, uh, stay in college, study science, engineering, and math, and learn to understand uh, that language and those characters. And uh, you can follow uh, their, this career path um, as well. So those are my remarks uh, for today. Uh, you can follow the action of the JWST mission uh, at NASA web, hashtag JWST, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, sir. So I guess now we can move on to the question and question and answer part. Hello. Hello, sir. Yes, I'm here. So now we can move on to the question and answer part, right? Yes. Okay, sir. So first question is, uh, is that like, uh, is JWST, that is James Webb Space Telescope, uh, will it be able to detect the dark matter, which is about 970% of our universe? So with the telescopic technologies, is it possible to detect dark matter uh, in our universe? Now, the JWST won't be able to see the dark matter because the dark matter uh, doesn't emit light. Uh, we are aware of its presence because of its gravitational influence on the matter that we can see, but the JWST will not be able to see it directly. Okay, sir. So the other question was like uh, the JWST uh, is uh, is able to see the past, so like if uh, if there is some, uh, it can sense the radi uh, radiations or the rays that are coming from very large distances, but they are very far. So like uh, the image we will be having will be of past. So is there any uh, technology or anything possible with, which with which we can have the present or uh, the near future kind of near past kind of some. I'm not sure I really, uh, really heard the question well. So the question is like that. Uh, the telescope is able to capture and uh, capture very, uh, the radiation from very large distances, mm -hmm. from very, uh, a very large billion light years distance. So mm -hmm. is it possible to detect or gain some information about near past incidents, uh, anything like oh. that? Yes, yes, the JWST will observe uh, uh, objects at enormous distances and everything in between. So we it can observe nearby objects like planets of our solar system and enormously distant objects like the first uh, galaxies and stars. And, uh, can JWST detect the presence of planet nine? <laughs> planet nine. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, planet nine is uh, very cold. 
So uh, I don't know if we'll be able to see it at our longest uh, uh, wavelength. It wouldn't surprise me if we tried. Okay. And uh, how will JWST protect itself from debris, space debris? Ah, um, JWST will be uh, subject to micrometeorite impact while throughout its mission. And so that is something that we've had to design for. So, uh, for example, the sun shield is designed to be uh, remain effective despite uh, a constant flux of micrometeorite impact that will create uh, little holes, in, for example, in the first layer of the sun shield. And uh, the Kapton material is designed so that um, it has a ripstop uh, feature to it so that those, those little holes will not... Uh, propagate large tears in the sun shield. Sun shield. But uh, that's an aspect of engineering that um, any deep space mission has to tackle. Uh, once you get into deep space, there will be micrometeorite uh, impacts on whatever spacecraft is sent there. Okay, sir. So like uh, with the help of this telescope, uh, can we get more information about sun? The JWST will not study the sun, or and it will not look uh, anywhere near the anywhere near the sun. It has to remain in the shadow of its uh, sun shield. Okay, sir. And uh, can we get any information about the origins or beyond that uh, origins of universe with this telescope and technology? Yeah, well, that's that's what we hope to do. We but we hope to uh, see the the birth of the first galaxies and the evolution of the structure of the universe uh, since that point. So we should get remarkably new understanding uh, of cosmology or remarkably good confirmation of what we currently think we understand. So it should be a transformational uh, mission in that regard in that it will be providing observations that uh, have never been achieved before. And can uh, can JWST present the uh, presence extraterrestrial life? Like if yes, then how, how is it possible? Extraterrestrial life. Well, uh, we are going to look for uh, biomarkers, uh, potential signatures of life in the atmospheres of exoplanets. So that is a prime mission objective. And uh, we will be trying hard uh, to do that. Now, uh, when we find biomarkers, biomarkers by themselves are not the same as discovering life. It's potential life. And it will require uh, lots of biomarkers in an exoplanet to build a solid case for life. And so it may take more than one mission, may take more than the JWST to build uh, a solid first discovery of life on an exoplanet. But uh, JWST will make, will, uh, make uh, enormous progress uh, on that problem. And we'll have to see how it goes. This is, this is uh, all completely new uh, science that's uh, never been achieved before. Sir, uh, like what are your thoughts on the newly found asteroid uh, in Africa, that is Sahara Desert, which is uh, stated to be older than Earth? Oh, the, the, um, the, the asteroid that came from um, outside the solar system, is that the one that you're referring to? Um, I don't really have a, a, an opinion about it. It's an object that came from outside the solar system uh, we weren't able to observe it with uh, uh, telescopes for very long. Um, and its nature is uh, somewhat of a mystery. We don't know for sure if objects like that are uh, unusual or common. Um, in, soon uh, the, uh, uh, a new ground-based telescope uh, will be commissioned. It's called the Vera Rubin Telescope that is designed specifically to uh, look for changes uh, in the night sky. And uh, when that telescope is operating, we'll know 
whether uh, objects like that uh, come through the solar system uh, frequently uh, or not. But uh, we'll just have to wait and see, but it's, it's, it's an exciting um, uh, new phenomenon uh, waiting to be studied. And uh, like, can, can we get a better picture of black holes uh, from this uh, telescope? Of this new technology. Well, this telescope can't observe, you know, black holes themselves, but um, we, it can observe the light from objects that are falling into uh, black holes. So I'm sure JWST, for example, will observe the black hole uh, at the center of our galaxy uh, and others. And, um, but it takes, uh, as do other observatories, that make similar observations uh, in the X-ray and so forth. So uh, black holes will be an important area of study for JWST for sure. Okay, sir. So, so that was all about the questions uh, that we got. All right. Well, okay. it was uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you all today. Okay, sir. Now I will. Uh, hand over to Darshan, Darshan Dabgar, who is the coordinator of Footprints 21, to present the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for giving us valuable time. Uh, on behalf of team, our teacher's team, and every person who is joined here, uh, I am once again, thank you for your time. And well. All right, it was my pleasure. And, uh, you know, have a wonderful evening. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir. So thank you for all the participants as well for attending this webinar and hope uh, you will be with us uh, throughout the journey of Footprints 21 that is up to 21st March and we will see you soon with other segments. Thank you.